I'm Robert Kelly. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at the church. If we haven't met yet, I'm so glad that you are here. I look forward to getting to know you. We are uh, kicking off our new series called Take Heart. It's going to be uh, a study in mostly the book of the Revelation. And so I hope uh, that I'm um, well, glad you're here for the kickoff of it. hope it goes well for us in the next uh, month or so. Leo Tolstoy he is the famed Russian writer of War and Peace. He tells this story. There is an Eastern fable told long ago of a traveler that was overtaken on a plane by an enraged beast. He says the traveler, escaping the beast, jumps into a dry well. But as he's jumping into the dry well, he notices that at the bottom of the well is a dragon with his jaws wide open waiting to consume him. And so this man grabs a branch that was growing out of the side of the well. Of course, his He's clinging there for dear life, knowing if he climbs out, he'll be eaten by the beast. If he lets go, he'll be eaten by the dragon. Yet, he clings with all of his might. His arms are starting to get tired. He can hold on a little while longer, but he, he feels the inevitability of his death coming. And then he notices at the branch, right where the branch comes out of the, the, the side of the well, there are two mice, a black and a white one circling round and round and round the, the twig that he's been holding on to, gnawing away at it as they go. Now he sees it's just a matter of time. It's inevitable that soon the mice will eat through the branch and he will drop to his certain death. Then while he's clinging for dear life, he notices some honey that has dripped onto some of the branches some of the leaves of the branch that he's been clinging to. So he reaches out with his tongue and he begins to taste the sweetness of this honey. He, in his own words, said it like this. So I, too, clung to this twig of life, knowing that the dragon of death was inevitably awaiting me, ready to tear me to pieces. And I could not understand why I had fallen into such torment. I tried to lick the honey which formerly consoled me, but the honey no longer gave me pleasure. And the white and the black mice of day and night gnawed at the branch by which I hung. I saw the dragon clearly, and the honey no longer tasted sweet. I only saw the inescapable dragon and the mice, and I could not tear my gaze from them. And this is not a fable, but the real unanswerable truth intelligible to all. So let's talk about the long road to the next 100,000 years or so. For the next year, you're going to mostly go on doing exactly what you're doing right now. Let's just say you're 25 to 35 years old. If you're not, adjust all of my dates here, my time periods for wherever you are at. In the next two to three years, you're going to work to establish your plans and start some long-term planning for your life. Years three to 10 are the years you're gonna work like a dog. You're gonna establish your family. In the next 10 to 20 years, you're gonna work hard. You're gonna accomplish much, make a name for yourself, no doubt. From 20 to 40 years, you're likely to slow down quite a bit. Retire, take up golf, maybe some other hobbies, maybe volunteer a little bit, play cards with your friends that sort of a thing. Within 40 to 60 years, you're going to die. Eventually, before the casket even decomposes, you will be eaten by worms. Happy Valentine's Day, <laughs> by the way. If you are a fraction of a percent of people remarkable by the world's standards, You'll make the history books and people will talk about you, but for how long? Eventually, you'll be forgotten. No one will visit your grave. People will stop reading your books, quoting your stats, recounting your achievements. Even longer term, the sun will increase in size from the cute little yellow dwarf that we have to a red giant. And in the process, it will consume 
our little blue marble. The universe will continue its cruel, cold expansion until the last star burns itself out and the universe is dead. Tolstoy, he wrote about this dreary conundrum we all face. He said, today or tomorrow, sickness and death will come to those I love or to me. Nothing will remain but stench and worms. Sooner or later, my affairs, whatever they may be, will be forgotten, and I shall not exist. Then why go on making any effort? How can man fail to see this, and how go on living? That is what is surprising. One can only live while one is intoxicated with life. As soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere fraud and a stupid fraud. That is precisely what it is. There is nothing either amusing or witty about it. It is simply cruel and stupid. He goes on to ask a question or two. My question was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man from the foolish child to the wisest elder. It was a question without an answer to which one cannot live as long as I, as well as I had found by experience. It was, what will come of what I am doing today or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed thus. Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? These are excellent, if not disturbing, questions. One, that our readings from this week actually address. Fortunately, as Tolstoy and countless others came to realize, things are not as they seem. If you can open in a Bible to Revelation chapter 1, we're starting in verse 1. We're all, uh, the, this, uh, as a church, we're participating in this read through the New Testament thing called Own It 365. We've just started the book of Revelation. We just uh, got the first two chapters under our belt. This morning, we're going to be studying the first chapter, and then uh, next week, we'll be looking at chapters two and three, but we'll be reading together the, the book of Revelation over the next month or so. And it starts with some really good news. Revelation chapter one, verse one, we see that Jesus, he reveals that this life is not all that there is, and that is an encouragement to us. That one day, this world will in fact be brought to an end. And when it comes to the questions of death and ultimate meaning of life, who else do you want to trust but the one who can see the whole picture? He tells us in verse 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ. I like this because it, it points to this idea that you know, this was, this was to reveal. You know, you see the word in there at least. It, it, this is the revealing of Jesus Christ. He's actually letting us know what is happening in the universe and what will take place for humanity, which is not how most of us approach this book. So many of us, we worry about how we're going to get to understand the revelation. It seems so confusing. It's incomprehensible. Many read it and they walk away bewildered. They walk away like, I, just, I don't understand, it's ridiculous, this is crazy, how am I supposed to get anything out of this book? It makes no sense. But it was meant to make some things clear. It was actually meant to reveal things to us, to let us know things about God. One of the scholars that I was reading, he gave me a, a helpful picture. He said, think of the book, think of the Revelation as a picture book, not as a puzzle book. It's not a puzzle that's meant to be solved. It's not a bunch of little pieces that need to be put together in just the right way. Think of it more like a picture book, one that you can flip through, understand, and glean from those pictures some very, very important lessons. Now, the imagery, of course, is bizarre, but it would not have seemed so bizarre to the original audience. This book contains little that is entirely new as far as imagery is concerned. Many of the ideas are gleaned, they're taken right out of the Old Testament, mixed in with a little bit of the dominant culture of that day, with a touch of the apocalyptic genre of which Revelation is a part. And you mix all of these things together, and a great number of themes and ideas and truths can, can be lifted out of this book. 
Think of it like uh, political cartoons today. All right, so here, here's the first of them. The Revenant. All right, so what do we know about this? What is this trying to say? The bear is what? The market going down. So, of course, it's attacking the Fed, which we know is Federal Reserve. Our economy really is what it's really going after. And, of course, the bear spray is empty, which is them spraying more dollars at it. But what about the reference be underneath it? The revenant. What's that from? So now you need to know the imagery of the bear. You need to know what the Fed represents. You need to know what the dollar sign symbol represents. And you need to actually have just seen a movie that was released like a month or two ago, right? To really get the full picture. But if you had all of those pieces, you know, the, you know what this means in, in a second. The images seem, you can imagine, out of the great deep, a beast that looketh like a beareth, cometh from the, you know, this is how you might want to describe this idea. It name upon its forehead was revenant. And, you know, it's so, you know, we could describe it like that, but of course the image is, is, it captures for us exactly. All right, here's the next one. So what's this trying to tell us? Trump is, of course, saying... This is my year, right? This is my, how do you know it's Trump? The hair and the fire. You're fired. And so, you know, you pick it up. And of course, you know, you, we all know the imagery of the man with, with the scythe. We understand this is one year leaving and the new year is coming. And of course, so they've taken this imagery, very common for us, and they've twisted it a little bit and they made it make a statement about the politics. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time, the guy's got a, a weapon right there next to him. But... <laughs> All right, here's the next one. So, so we get this, right? What is this? Right? This shows just the ridiculous nature of our political system. Right now, the two main parties constantly pointing fingers. Now, try to describe this to someone. A creature that looketh like it was an elephant cometh out of the sea and out of that, but its face was not the face of an elephant. It had the face of a hand, man's hand pointing, and upon its head was a hat, and out of that hat was another hand. See, you could go crazy with this, but of course, within a second, you get it. You understand. I like this next one. To me, is so proper. <laughs> and, the, and the beast, who appeared as a donkey, placed his hand inside the creature with the red, white, and blue garb. And there we get all what all of us know to be true. This one, I, I like this last. This is, I like this one just because just I think it's funny. Muhammad, Buddha, Jesus, walk into a bar. No, but think of all the images you've got to know and you've got to have a, an understanding of in order to, but now you get it, you know what this is saying. Come on, what are they doing in the name of all of these religious leaders? They would be so upset, but you'd have to know what the three major religions talk about. You'd have to, and further, you'd have to ask yourself, why does one have club soda, one has tea, and why is one drinking wine? Like, you get it because you know all of these images. But imagine trying to describe this to someone that doesn't know any of these world religions, doesn't know any of their teaching, doesn't know why the guy in the end's got the, the wine, Right, and on and on we go. The imagery can be difficult in the book of Revelation, but much of it was understandable to its original audience. And by the way, the stuff that was meant to be obscured often still is meant to be obscured. Sometimes we're trying to force it to reveal secrets that it was meant to conceal until another day came when it would be made plain. Then in the second verse... Uh, second half of verse 1, he says, Which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. He's referencing here the, the day of the Lord. We'll talk about that another time. But look at verse 4. We, hear, we see here that there is life beyond this world. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, past, present, and future, and from the seven spirits before his throne. That's a way of referring to the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold spirit, the perfect spirit. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Oh, there's a firstborn. That means there's going to be 
a second born and a third born and even a fourth born. And of course, that's the promise that we get, that death isn't the end. There's a first born from the dead, but there will be more to follow. And the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for how long? Forever and ever. Amen. This points to a reality that this world is not all there is. Another awaits us. And all humanity is going to pass through that veil of death and we'll find eternal life on the other side. That means that this life matters. What we do in this life matters for eternity, matters for the next life. And the reason that Tolstoy and many others had viewed life as meaningless is because they had not yet seen the age that was to come. They didn't believe in it. So despair about this life and the meaninglessness of this life, it ought to impact all great thinkers. Most people, they just continue to, to lick the honey to try to distract themselves from the reality. But the great thinkers quickly get past that and they end with despair and meaninglessness because they haven't yet seen behind the veil. But ultimately, Jesus, he lets us see behind the veil and he gives us hope. This is a huge message, a huge theme in the book of Revelations. And even a child can understand it when they read through this book. Jesus promised us here that life is eternal. And then he backed that up with the credibility that comes with this profound sign of his resurrection. And if a man can do that, who else do you want to believe about eternal things? So he starts here with good news, but of course it quickly turns to bad. Look at verse 7. Look, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. He says the world will weep. They will mourn. Some translations say wail. So the earth will be wailing. They will, they will be torn up when they see him return. This also is an easy to understand, if not terrifying theme that returns again and again in this book. The return of Jesus isn't good news for everyone. It isn't good news for everyone. His return will lead to an inevitable encounter. There's an end to this life and this world. An encounter with Jesus is inevitable for everyone. Look at verse 8. I am the Alpha and Omega. This is the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So he's the A and he's the Z, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos. He was in exile at this point, and he was writing in exile from this island in the Mediterranean. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus... On the Lord's day, Sunday, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philly, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. He's probably pointing to his function as a priest, the priestly robes, with a golden sash that also points to the garb of the high priest around his chest. The, air, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. This imagery is from Daniel, Old Testament, chapter 7. And it refers to the ancient of days. It gives the, the picture to God and now to Christ as the wisest of all wives. He's the, he, he captures full and perfect wisdom in his being. That's what the, the white has snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. Another common Old Testament image that indicates that he can see. He's the revealer of human secrets. He's the revealer of the human heart. And he has the power to burn away sin and impurity and bring judgment. 
His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Here's again the theme of judgment returning. These feet will stomp out his enemies. And of course, he will be the bringer of war. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. It speaks to his authority and to his power. And in verse 16, in his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. He'll tell us about the seven stars in a minute. But this vision of Jesus is magnificent. It's supposed to capture for us this incredible strength and power, the crashing sounds and the double-edged sword and the brilliant blinding light. The Son of Man is a reference to this mysterious human figure that's found in the Old Testament, Daniel 7, Daniel 10, Ezekiel chapter 1. It's this human figure who brings an end to the useless cycles of human government. They'll all be ended. This picture is meant to be able to stop you in your tracks, cause this uh, this heart-stopping, breath-stealing, sort of anxiety, panic attack producing experience when we encounter this raw, unadulterated power and glory. You see, there is going to be an inevitable encounter with this power for everyone. Yet, we need not fear this day if we're on the correct side of this war. Look at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. A very normal and common response. When people get into the presence of God, it seems as if they think they're just going to simply be undone. Like somehow their molecules will, will lose cohesion and they'll just be undone right there and then in front of this almighty power. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John falls as though dead because of this awe-inspiring majesty of Jesus. And yet, we need not fear. See, this encounter can bring us all of the things that we need to rightly relate to our creator. The awe, the humility, the confidence, and the security. You know, how, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? You've stood on the edge, you've seen it, right? A couple of you. You're standing on the edge and it's just, it's awesome. And you want to step back a little bit, but you sort of want to look over the edge, but you don't want to get too close to it. Or maybe Niagara Falls, you've been up to Niagara Falls, and you're standing there and you're listening to the water just rushing over, just crushing, and you're like just hearing the roar of it all. And there's this exhilarating sort of intensity to the moment. It's, you know, you, you want to draw near to it, but you're also intimidated by what it is that you're seeing. It's just something so spectacular. The awe of the moment can grip you. And of course, it's not the only thing. We used to live in the Midwest and there were these storms. You could just see them for miles because it's all flat, no hills, no mountains. We were out in Chicagoland. And you could see these, these thunderstorms just cover it, all, the whole field of vision just surrounding you, lightning and thunder and crashing. And they were, they, they were, it was unbelievable to watch and terrifying the thought that it was coming toward you. We were in L.A., we were caught in an earthquake, a big one down in uh, L.A., and that one was uh, certainly uh, somewhat nerve-wracking, but not as nerve-wracking as the massive quake we experienced when we were in Guam. And all the things you depend upon in this world seem, they, they're frail, they're fragile. The earth itself is shaking. I mean, it's just, it's giving itself up in ways that you're, it's convulsing under your feet. And this went on, we went on a minute longer. It was just craziness. You're like, what is going on? You know, you remember the, the military campaign we, we, we talked about it and we were bombing in Iraq and it was this, the shock and awe, right? That's what we were going for, shock and awe. Shock and awe for our enemies, but how does it, what does it do for us? For us, we say, oh my goodness, what kind of power is at our disposal to protect us? For our security, for our hope. You see, it, these are the, capture all of these, these ideas in a vision of, of Jesus. That's what John is trying to capture for us, these experiences and these emotions. And he's trying to say, can you, can you begin to get a sense of what it was like to stand in the presence of this son of man, the ancient of days? You see, what does this mean for us? It means that things are not what they seem. And we can take that to heart. 
we can take it to heart. There is no need to fear death or to despair that life has no meaning. There's a, a great theologian, Reverend Chesney, he once said, everybody wants to go to heaven, get their wings and fly around. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. <laughs> nobody want to go now. See, listen, we don't want to go now because we don't understand. We fear what we don't see, what we don't, need to, what we don't know, but we don't need to fear what comes next. We are eternal creatures, and the prince of this world is the intruder, and one day he will permanently be kicked out, and we will win in the end. The veil of death has already been pierced. Fear has been sent retreating through the resurrection of Christ and his promise of eternal life to us. So we don't need to distract ourselves with this mean, from this meaningless life that we so often engage and think about what's really going on, what really matters. You know, the man hanging from the twig, licking the honey, trying to get some joy out of this meaningless life. We don't have to think in these ways. You know, we'll sometimes pursue whatever it might be. You know, we're pursuing that relationship that has to become all-encompassing for us. We need to be with her all the time. We need to be with him all the time. And if I'm with that person all the time, if they, if they love me, if I love them, then, then life has some meaning. This matters. And only then am I really going to be happy. But if you're not careful, what it really amounts to is nothing more than a little taste of honey distracting you from the inevitable fall into the abyss. We throw ourselves into our work. We try to suppress the haunting thoughts that our lives don't really matter for anything. We immerse ourselves in friends and technology in order to distract us from that hole that is gnawing in our souls. These are often good things that we pursue that are trying to keep us from dealing with eternal things, the things that actually matter. And we don't need to live that way. We don't need to medicate ourselves into emotional oblivion. We need not keep ourselves so busy that reflection on our lives becomes impossible. And yet that's exactly what so many of us do. But life can, in fact, have meaning and beauty and purpose and hope because the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days, will prevail. This world, it can be, it can be so overwhelming. It can be so overwhelming. You watch the news, read a magazine, you know, just... You know, pick up the newspaper and thumb through it a little bit. Watch any of the, you know, the campaign coverage. It, just, it can be overwhelming, but we can take to heart that whatever, whatever may happen to you, whatever is happening to you, do not fear. Jesus says, I am who I am. I have the victory. Do not fear. You know, we have a group of folks here who are disciple makers. You're working with other people who are newer to the faith and you're helping shape and form them and, and help create in them a sense of God's presence and awareness and a learning of the Bible and a reading. You're holding accountable. These disi you disciple makers here, listen, this is one of these important lessons, a wildly important topic that we have to pass on to the next generation of Christ followers. It's too easy to lose this in our day, to think that this stuff here right now is all that actually matters and forget that there is a battle that is raging around us, one that we are a part of, and there are promises given to us for the future that ought to change the way we live and the decisions we make now. A hope that goes beyond hope. We've got to pass this on, disciple makers, to the next generation. Because you've, you want to get on the right side of this thing. You must get on the right side of this thing. Because there were two responses that we saw in this text. When Jesus returns, there's the whole group of people who will weep and wail and mourn. And then there's the other group who, though struck with fear, will hear those amazingly tender words. The hand of Jesus on you saying, do not fear. Do not fear. 
Last thought, the lampstand, the lampstand imagery. It comes from the temple, tabernacle before that, the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem that was destroyed, but all of it is a picture of the temple, the heavenly temple. So there are the lampstands that even sit before the throne of God in heaven. We're told that they represent the people of God. Well, why lampstands? Because they're shining their light. Remember, whoever has a light, who puts it under a bushel? The city on a hill can't be hidden. It's all that kind of imagery here. It's as if he, even here we are being reminded to be a light. We've got to see this. I mean, listen, there, this isn't, the, the return of Jesus isn't simply good news. It's also bad news, terrible news. And if you are in fact a follower of Christ and you already know this, then you are a lampstand. You are a light shining in the darkness. You are someone who's standing before the presence of God trying to reveal to a world caught in darkness that there is hope. So will you shine? Will you think in eternal ways? Be a light. Bless your neighbor. Be the lampstand that we were called to be. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we come into this book and so easy for us to get tripped up in the many details and the wondering and the timelines and the, which country does this and when and where. And Father, we can miss the forest for the trees. Your encouragement to us in this chapter is profound. And yet it's woven in with this terrible warning. It's as if you're trying to awaken a people that remain deaf, dumb, blind. Lord, these pictures, these images, may they sit deep in our souls. May they rattle us awake. I pray, Lord, that each person here would come to terms with this inevitable encounter. Lord, we will, each and every one of us, be brought before your throne. I ask, Lord, that each person here would decide to have that encounter now, on this side of eternity, where your mercy and your love flow, where your sacrifice is still accessible to us. Pray that you'd stir up our hearts, that we might see it, embrace it for all that we are, trusting in you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.